I'm going to test something here. Uh, humanity was a mistake. We should nuke them all. You said you were going to cheer no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supporting you. Thank you. Um, but no, uh, so I suppose the first question is kind of uh, who here has read Martin Heidegger? Who here has read uh, Jean Paul Sartre? Okay, a couple. Uh, who has read Albert Camus? A couple. Who's listened to Kendrick Lamar? A lot more. Who's listened to Metallica? Who's, um, who's listened to Marilyn Manson? Yeah, a lot more. Um, generally, this kind of denotes something that uh, I've been trying to argue, and it goes towards a question that philosophy majors have overall been having a problem with, and specifically professors, which is this general dread that philosophy <laughs> is not taken as seriously. Philosophy is dying out. It's kind of seen as passe or overly um, pretentious. Uh, but I believe that philosophy is actually more prevalent today than it ever has been, but simply that it has changed essentially the discourse and specifically that there is a formal philosophical discourse and there is a cultural philosophical discourse. Now the difference between these two uh, is essentially the difference between European existentialism and American existentialism. Not one to one, but these are general trends that we tend to see within these two fields. Um, European existentialism engaging more with formal discourse is very concerned about um, the logical argumentation, uh, published papers, having rigorous discourse about the very fundamental natures of existentialism overall. On the American side of things, there is a much bigger crowd dealing with how to culturally communicate the same ideas. Not to the same rigorous standard as you would see in academic papers, but very much a similar content. And what this is, in, on the American side of things, is a philosophical engagement more so than the formal discourse. And by engagement, I mean that when people are engaging very much within American culture, uh, large swaths of American culture, including hip hop, metal, uh, several movies, books, they are engaging and uh, acquiring sort of an existential sense, even if they're not as rigorously uh, involved as reading the nothingness by uh, Sartre. The reason I say Hunter S. Thompson sits as a pretty good archetype of this shift uh, is essentially that he sits at a perfect middle point between these two fields. Hunter S. Thompson uh, wrote to several friends and has made numerous uh, references towards uh, continental philosophy overall. Uh, in a letter to his friend in 1954, he advised him to read Being and Nothingness by Sartre, and he mentions Camus uh, several times throughout his later books. What Thompson did, separate from the existentialists, the continental philosophers that came before him, was that instead of taking a rigorous uh, dive into the philosophical discourse, he decided to infuse his work with the very essence of those ideas. And we can actually see this shift in prior to um, 1967. Most of his work was very much within the vein of objective journalism, in which there is a strict, uh, strict separation between him as author and the subject matter in which he is writing. He is not part of the story. He doesn't infuse himself into the story. He is just telling the story from an objective standpoint, completely separated. In 1960, I think it was five, but I might get the year wrong. He integrated himself into the Hell's Angels uh, as part of an, investi an investigative procedure in which he wanted to understand more about these uh, motorcycle gangs and specifically these people who seemed to be so hellbent on removing themselves from the American North. And the result of that was his uh, 1967 book, Hell's Angels in which a decent portion of it still held his objective journalism style, in which uh, pretty much the first half, he's just explaining the social or cultural uh, milieu that is happening at the time. And then in 1970,
And then the latter half of the book is very much his personal experience while hanging out with the Hells Angels. Um, and this is sort of when he starts playing himself as both subject and object. He is standing outside of the story, but also infusing himself in the story. After that comes uh, the Kentucky Derby. It, the Kentucky Derby is decadent and deranged, in which most of it is actually quite comical because he spends the entire time saying, we are here at the Kentucky Derby to see a riot. We want to see these people go mad, go crazy, constantly talking about how the army's going to roll in at any point and just start shooting a bunch of people for uh, black rights uh, protests. That event never happens. But after a night of debauchery, getting into fights, getting kicked out of bars, Thompson himself shows up to his photographer's uh, hotel room, and he looks in the mirror, and he says, my God, that's the face we were looking for. And it's from that essay on that we got the Hunter S. Thompson that most people know, which is the fear and loathing in Las Vegas, the, uh, ha about half of what comes out of the Great, uh, the great Shark Hunt, uh, most of what comes out of Better Than Sex, Confessions of a Political Junkie, just pure deranged rambling that most people, upon first glance, really wonder what the hell is going on. They learn he did quite a bit of drugs, and they go, eh, whatever. that works, <laughs> makes sense. Um, but that was essentially him turning the existentialism into his work. He didn't move over into the formal philosophical discourse. He decided instead to take what the discourse was saying and infuse it directly into his journalism. And from there, we get Gonzo journalism. <coughs> this sort of um, this sort of methodology has stuck around within the American cultural sphere ever since then. Many metal artists will constantly talk about how they love Hunter S. Thompson's work. Um, several rap artists, including DMX, has actually talked about how Hunter S. Thompson was influential for them in frameworking things. And we can see how many of them in the interviews and such talk about their work as not only a nice musical outlet, they believe they are giving something, giving some essential truth that you cannot get anywhere else. And in fact, um, Robert Walser wrote one of the first sociological musicologist understandings of metal fans. And most of them said that the main driving force of why they listened to metal was not because it was angry music, it wasn't because it was cool music, it was because they felt like they were getting some essential truth that they could not find anywhere else. This is the uh, inherent core difference between cultural, uh, the cultural philosophical discourse and the formal phil uh, philosophical discourse. And it's why I believe, personally, the American culture has been so dominant worldwide. It's because when people engage with that culture, there is all sorts of interesting other aspects. Uh, aesthetically, America is uh, kind of different, um, but also economically, we're very powerful. Um, militarily, we've pushed ourselves out, and that's going to play a part. But I believe the reason it stays, I believe the reason why American culture tends to keep propagating is because people are engaging with philosophy through those works in a way that doesn't exactly pop up in a lot of other places. It has, it's starting, uh, it has been for the last decade or so, but it's more that other cultures are kind of catching up to art as a uh, sort of Trojan horse for philosophy rather than the other way around. Now, I believe that understanding this discourse is more important than it ever has been. And the specific reason for that is because how we engage with culture is entering into a radical fundamental shift in the generation era. Uh, moving through the information era, culture could just propagate out incredibly quickly. But now, with art generation, music generation, through AI technologies, how we're going to be engaging with culture over is going to radically shift. And we have no idea what the effects of that are going to be. But if culture has been a fundamental discourse for many people to understand their own worldview, and then that discourse is being provided by non-human actors, that might have that might have 
radical shifts in how we actually uh, structure our own understanding. And personally, I, I think it is an immediate problem. That's it. Oh, good So do you, can you name any um, like European philosophical motifs that has um, transferred um, over to um, like American culture? Like can you give like any specific examples? I think historically, say? yes. Uh, pragmatism on the American side very much came from, uh, not exactly, but not exactly a full adoption, but it did take a lot of the ideas of uh, Kant and just sort of transform them into kind of an economic worldview that America was existing at the time. So we, we've inherited a lot of the philosophical discourse that came from Europe, but um, a lot of philosophers on this side of the pond, the big worry they have is like, we're taking it in, we're not putting it out. Like, the world doesn't hear in American philosophy. Uh, the point of what I'm saying is they have. It just hasn't been books and articles. It's been in music and movies and such. But we're, we're still taking it in, absolutely. So it's Mickey Mouse's fault? It's Mickey Mouse's fault, yes. Anyway. That's actually one, one element is part of why people look at like Disney remakes and they say, ah, this is soulless, it doesn't feel anything. That's an element of it. It's, it fe it's supposed to be the same thing, like the movies you grew up with. You're supposed to be getting the same content. But people can just feel the inherent like soullessness the non-authenticity of, of many of these remakes. Because we don't put the philosophy or essential thoughts yeah. we want to put in. You, it just comes in with all the economic baggage of like, that people paid a bunch for this before, we'll do it again. <laughs> and then people do, and then they just keep making it, so. Do you think as uh, we see an increase in remakes and not original things and the loss of moral background and stories um, that we will fade, like American culture will fade in other parts of the world? Yes and no. In some ways, okay. That is kind of an interesting one um, because very recently the South Korean uh, film industry has been more successful overseas than it ever has been. So I think there are, there's absolutely an interest in uh, what is being made elsewhere, and I think, yes, a, an element of that is just this uh, kind of tiredness, uh, tiredness, tired, 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 tired. <laughs> fatigue. <laughs> um, this fatigue that a lot of American audiences have of like, how many Star Wars movies are they gonna come out with? How many Marvel movies are they? Like, there's, there's a fatigue with what we're producing, so when something like Parasite comes out, it feels so new and so radical that uh, a lot of people did flock to it. So there, there's room that is coming in. One more. Yeah. Um, I have like four questions. I'll just give them to you and you can decide what you want to answer. Uh, what are the main philosophical ideas that we're seeing in cultural production now? Mm -hmm. Are there any new ones? And also what you make of things like ContraPoints, Philosophy 2, you know, different things on the internet that are trying to like bring philosophy to a wider audience but with lots of color and costumes and if you're familiar. Okay, so um, what cultural ideas? Uh, the reason I, I brought up existentialism as kind of the uh, core is because I think a lot of what we're grappling with is existentialist ideas right now. Um, and it's all over, the, all over the place. There are plenty of people that are trying to like inject a traditionalist viewpoint. There's plenty of people who, uh, and feminism has actually been more popular than it ever has been, and I think part of that is is the cultural discourse. Um, but for the most part, it, like existentialism seems to be the core. Like, how do we grapple with a world that inherently just seems to be going nowhere and spinning its wheels? Doesn't actually mean anything. That seems to be the core of many much of the discourse. Um, now, as for YouTubers, uh, I. There's two different levels to that. There is uh, a 
could be and what it is. The could be is I think, I don't think YouTube as a platform inherently disallows uh, that discourse. However, I think the vast majority of the discourse that currently exists is so watered down and generally to a specific point. That is, they're not arguing um, a lot of their points because it's a rigorous examination of an idea. It's very much they come up with the end answer and then they kind of build towards that. Um, which again, that's not how it has to be inherently. Now, that actually, that is something I didn't bring up. Even though it's moved to the cultural discourse, there is a further discussion that can be had on is that for the better or worse. Is a cultural discourse like inherently more useful to people or less useful? And that's kind of a no idea. I don't even know how you would measure that. So uh, I think YouTube, it's very much the same thing. Uh, people could make the argument, yeah, it's for the better because they can digest it easier. Or somebody could make the argument of like, but they're not saying anything. <laughs> um, that's going to be an interesting conversation moving forward. All right, thank you, Austin. <laughs>